We should now have a better understanding of what philosophy is. We also know the difference between instinctive and careful reasoning, and that careful reasoning is generally trustworthy. But of course, now we wonder, how exactly do we reason carefully? It involves actively avoiding all the ways that instinctive reasoning can lead us astray, but that's just the beginning. We must also learn the rules of logic, the science of reasoning, and how to apply them. Since the ancient philosopher Aristotle was its father, and the last word of logic for almost 2,000 years, let's start there. Aristotle's three axioms of logic are still accepted today. He called them the laws of thought. They are what one must assume before making any argument. Here they are. The law of non-contradiction. No proposition is both true and false. The law of excluded middle. Every proposition is either true or false. And the law of identity. Everything is identical to itself. Now, I've had students try to disprove these laws by presenting counterexamples. For example, one student suggested that the law of non-contradiction isn't always true because a person can both be alive and dead, alive physically, but dead emotionally. But this misunderstands the law. I am physically alive and I am emotionally alive are not the same proposition. So one can be true while the other is false. What the law says is that one and the very same proposition cannot both be true and false. It cannot both be true, for example, that someone is physically alive at a particular time, but also false that that same person is physically alive at that exact same particular time. Once understood, the laws are obviously true. So obvious, in fact, that they need no argument. And that's good because since they're the laws that underlie all arguments, you can't present an argument for these laws without just arguing in a circle. But if anyone ever says they reject these laws, you can simply say what Aristotle would have. I can't talk to you. It's impossible to communicate with someone who rejects these laws. Imagine a conversation with someone who rejects non-contradiction and thinks something can both be true and false. Were you at Steve's party? Yeah, I had a great time. Was Bob there? How would I know? I wasn't there. You just said you were there. No, I didn't. Well, where were you? I was at Steve's party. Clearly, even engaging in discussion with someone who rejects logic's axioms is a waste of time. You might think one, no one ever does reject them, but it's a common tactic people try when they realize that their position is wrong or incoherent because it's forced them to contradict themselves. Now, when reasoning carefully, one wants to discover arguments that work. But that doesn't just mean arguments that are persuasive. As we've seen, bad arguments can be very persuasive. But as philosophers, we want arguments that get at the truth, regardless of their persuasiveness. What we want to do is learn how to reason correctly, how to determine whether the premises of an argument are true and whether or not or what degree its conclusion is supported by its premises. Now, Aristotle divided all arguments into two kinds, deductive and inductive. And that, that's a division that still holds today. However, our understanding of deduction and induction has advanced considerably since Aristotle. For example, he suggested deduction reasoned from the universal to the particular, and that induction reasoned from the particular to the universal. And indeed, many non-philosophy textbooks still use these definitions. But, as we shall shortly see, both of these suggestions were inaccurate. Let's talk about deduction First, the rules Aristotle developed for deduction mainly concern so-called categorical arguments. Here's a classic example of an Aristotelian categorical deduction. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Notice this argument does go from the general to the specific. We begin with a general statement about all men, and end up with a conclusion regarding a specific person. But not all categorical arguments have specific conclusions. For example, all dogs are mammals, 
all mammals are animals, therefore all dogs are animals. This is a deductive categorical argument, but its conclusion is no more specific than either of its premises. But one thing these arguments do have in common is that the truth of their conclusion is guaranteed by the truth of their premises. If those premises were true, it would not be possible for the conclusion to be false. And this is how modern logicians define deductive reasoning today. A few qualifications aside, a deductive argument is an argument with a conclusion that follows necessarily from the premises. Another thing that Aristotle missed is that placing things in categories is not the only way to present an argument with premises that guarantee its conclusion. Now, the history of logic is long and complex and involves developments from some of the biggest names in philosophy. Gottlob Frege, Bertrand Russell, Alfred North Whitehead, Kurt Gödel, and many others. The beginning of the 20th century was a particularly groundbreaking time in logic, and many of the things taught in logic classes today stem from discoveries made during that time. But we can boil their discoveries down to some useful basics. Most importantly, it was discovered that all deductive arguments can be broken down into specific statements and the logical relationships that are said to be true of them or hold between them. Here are the five most basics. Affirmation. A statement, call it P, is true. As a shortcut, we can just say P. And there's a the conditional. One statement entails another. If P, then Q. Disjunction. Either one statement is true or another one is. P or Q. Conjunction. Two statements are true together, P and Q. And then there's negation. A statement is false, not P. For most arguments, we can break down the relationships between its statements using these concepts. For ease of reference, logicians represent these relationships by placing symbols between the letters that represent the statements. In this way, one can symbolize arguments. The next step is to realize that certain rules govern what can be derived. For example, if we know that some statement P is true, but we also know that P entails some other statement Q, then we can derive that Q is true. This line of reasoning is called modus ponens, which gets its name from the Latin for mood that affirms. If P then Q, P, therefore Q. By affirming the antecedent of the conditional, its first part, you affirm the consequent, its second part. Notice that the premises of an argument that takes this form would guarantee its conclusion even though it does not take an Aristotelian categorical form. For example, if the price of oil will rise, then the price of gas will rise. The price of oil will rise, therefore the price of gas will rise. This has nothing to do with Aristotelian categories. I'd be straining to put these premises in an all A's or B's kind of form, but clearly the conclusion still follows. Here's another rule, modus tollens, Latin for mood that denies. If P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Or there's denying the consequent of the conditional allows us to deny the antecedent. It works too. Example, if you are in Paris, then you are in France. You are not in France, therefore you are not in Paris. Here's another, disjunctive syllogism. It's either A or it's B, but it's not A, therefore it must be B. Its validity is obvious. For example, the light is either on or it's off. It's not off, therefore it must be on. So. Some rules are so obvious they don't even need an example, like the rules regarding conjunction, conjunction construction. If P is true and Q is true, then both P and Q are true. Simple enough. Conjunction simplification. If P and Q are both true, then P is true. Other rules are quite complex, like constructive dilemma. If either P or R is true, but P entails Q and R entails S, then either Q or S is true. But we can still see that the rule is valid by simply using the example. 
This one you might have heard in 2012. Either Obama or Romney will win the presidency. If Obama wins, we will have a Democrat as president. And if Romney wins, we'll have a Republican. Therefore, we will either have a Democrat or a Republican as president. This is symbolic logic. And with it, we can evaluate complex arguments that go far beyond the three-line categorical arguments that concerned Aristotle. For example, here's a difficult one. Bob is overweight and male. If he's overweight, then he's not in shape. And either he's in shape or he needs to get in shape. If he is healthy, then he doesn't need to get in shape. Therefore, Bob is overweight and not healthy. Now, that may have seemed a bit complex, and perhaps Aristotle could have handled it by transposing it into many different categorical arguments, but by simply symbolizing it and using the rules we mentioned above, we could show that conclusion necessarily follows from those premises. Now, interestingly, symbolic logic can't actually handle all the categorical arguments that Aristotle was interested in. To do that, you have to turn symbolic logic into predicate calculus, something that's far too complicated to discuss here. But with both symbolic logic and Aristotle's understanding of categorical logic, we can evaluate just about any deductive argument. There's another matter on which Aristotle and modern logicians disagree. According to Aristotle, to be a deductive argument, an argument's conclusion had to follow necessarily from its premises. If it didn't, then the argument wasn't deductive, it was just simply mistaken. He was able to be so restrictive with his definition because he was only dealing with three-line categorical arguments, and there's only a finite number of ways to combine two categorical premises so that they guarantee their conclusion. Modern logicians, however, do not have that luxury, since in reality, there's an infinite number of ways for a set of premises to guarantee a conclusion, and infinite ways for them to fail to do so. So, modern logicians consider an argument deductive when the person presenting the argument merely intends for the conclusion to be guaranteed by its premises. It is then the logician's task to discover which ones successfully do so, and which ones do not. But there are two questions to ask regarding whether or not a deductive argument does what it is supposed to do. The first question is regarding its validity. Would the premises, if they were true, guarantee the conclusion? Does the argument take the right form? If so, then the argument is valid. Now, it's important to note that in logic, the word valid does not mean what people often think it means. It's not synonymous with good or strong, as in, that's a valid point. No, in logic, where the word originates, only arguments can be valid. Statements cannot be valid. And while we're at it, only statements can be true. Arguments cannot. Arguments can have true conclusions, but arguments cannot as a whole be true. So, truth is only a property of statements, validity is only a property of arguments. A statement is true if it matches up to the way the world is, and an argument is valid if, and only if, it has the right kind of structure. But, how can we tell if an argument has the right kind of structure? How can we tell if it's valid? Well, if we suppose that the premises of the argument are true, and then realize that that would mean that the conclusion also had to be true, then we know the argument is valid. In other words, if it would be impossible for the premises of an argument to be true while its conclusion was false, then it has the right structure. Then the argument is valid. So, when testing an argument for validity, we don't care whether or not the premises are true. When testing for validity, we only care what would follow if its premises were true. If we assume that the premises are true and then realize that the argument's conclusion would necessarily follow, then we know the argument is valid. So, for example, I know that the following argument is valid. All men are male, Sue is a man, therefore Sue is male. Now, I have no idea whether that second premise is true, whether Sue is a man or not. Maybe it's false. After all, Sue is generally a girl's name. But 
Then again, maybe an absent father named his son Sue because he thought it would toughen him up. Thank you, Johnny Cash. Consequently, I also don't know whether the conclusion is true. But that doesn't matter for validity. I know the argument is valid because I know that if the premises were true, the conclusion would have to be. And I know this because it has, this argument has a classic structure Aristotle defined as valid. All A's are B's, X is an A, therefore X is a B. Any argument that takes that form is valid. Or take this argument. If the moon is made out of green cheese, then Benjamin Franklin was president. The moon is made out of green cheese, therefore Benjamin Franklin was president. This argument's premises and its conclusion are obviously false, but that doesn't keep the argument from being valid. It still has good form. Yes, the premises are false, but if the premises were true, the conclusion would have to be. If the moon being made out of green cheese somehow did guarantee that Benjamin Franklin was president, and it was also the case that the moon really was made out of green cheese, then it would have to be the case that Benjamin Franklin was president. Now, teaching you to test any given argument uh, for validity would take more time than we have. But in this case, we can tell by looking. The Ben Franklin moon argument follows a common valid form, modus ponens. In this case, if M then B, M therefore B. Any argument that takes that form is valid, no matter what its premises and conclusion are. But not all deductive arguments are valid. If a person intends for the premises to guarantee their conclusion, then the argument is deductive, but sometimes people are mistaken. They think that their conclusion would be guaranteed by their premises when in fact it would not. This happens so often that some such mistakes have names. For example, affirming the consequent. If P then Q, Q therefore P. This one gets its name from its second premise where the consequent of the conditional is affirmed. And we can demonstrate its invalidity with an example that takes the same form. If I'm in Oklahoma, then I am in America. I am in America, therefore I am in Oklahoma. Clearly, this argument is invalid. The premises could both be true, but the conclusion still false. Being in Oklahoma does entail that one is in America, but there are ways of being in America other than being in Oklahoma, like being in Nevada. If I were standing in Nevada, the premises of that argument would be true, but the conclusion would be false. Here's another common invalid deductive argument form, denying the antecedent. If P then Q, not P, therefore not Q. This argument gets its name because the second premise denies the antecedent of the conditional. Any argument that follows this form is also invalid. For example, if I play the trumpet, then I play a musical instrument. I don't play the trumpet, therefore I don't play a musical instrument. Again, the argument is invalid. A trumpet isn't the only way that one can play an instrument. I, for example, still play a musical instrument, even though I don't play the trumpet, I play the drums. But even if an argument is valid, that doesn't mean that we're forced to accept its conclusion. As we saw before the Ben Franklin Moon argument, the fact that an argument's premises would guarantee its conclusion forces us to believe that conclusion only if the premises of that argument actually are true. If they're not, then the argument does not establish its conclusion. Now, the conclusion might still be true, but if the person giving the argument wants to establish that, they are going to have to give a different argument. But if a valid argument's premises are also true, then there's no way around it. The argument's conclusion is true. We must accept it. If the truth of an argument's premises would guarantee its conclusion and that argument's premises actually are true, well, then its conclusion must be true. Arguments that are valid and also have true premises are said to be sound arguments. Sound arguments are the holy grail of philosophy. They guarantee that you are on the side of truth. However, unfortunately, they are very hard to come by, or at least very difficult to verify. 
So far, I've been merely using simple examples about unimportant things for the sake of example. But if an argument is about something important, especially something important to philosophers, whether or not the premises are true is almost always debatable, as we shall soon see. Every deductive argument is either valid or it's not. And whether it is, is mathematically provable. But it's very difficult to establish that an argument is sound. Now, we could spend an entire course on deduction, but let's move on to induction. Aristotle didn't say much about inductive arguments other than that they reason from the particular to the universal. He did relate it to what he called scientific reasoning, reasoning about causes, and indeed such reasoning often does go from the particular to the universal. But, and we shall soon see this as well, many inductive arguments don't reason from the particular to the universal, including scientific arguments. Today, logicians contrast inductive arguments with deductive ones based on the intended relationship between their premises and conclusion. The premises of an inductive argument aren't supposed to guarantee its conclusion, like in deduction. They are merely supposed to provide good support. If their truth would provide good support, then we say the argument is strong. And if the premises actually are true, then the argument is cogent. Inductive strength is somewhat analogous to deductive validity. A few problems aside, it's basically a matter of structure. But unlike validity, inductive strength comes in degrees. Some inductive arguments are stronger than others. And while validity can be mathematically demonstrated, whether an argument is strong or weak is sometimes difficult to determine. Since the conclusion of inductive arguments are not guaranteed, you might think inductive reasoning is inferior to deduction. But in many ways, induction is more powerful than deduction. For one, it's a lot easier to show that a conclusion is likely true than it is to prove that it's true. So good inductive arguments are simply easier to come by. They're easier to produce. But more importantly, inductive arguments can generate such a high degree of probability to their conclusion that the fact that they're not 100% proven is irrelevant. For example, all scientific arguments are inductive. So technically, no scientific conclusion